Good day, brothers and sisters. It is Sunday once again. It is not just Sunday today. It is Resurrection Sunday. And friends, the doctrine of the resurrection is one of the reasons why we have to worship God. Because we understand that there is an afterlife. Our Lord Jesus Christ did not only redeem us and pay for our sins, but He likewise redeemed our whole person and our whole being, spirit, soul, and body. And that being the case, you and I will experience a resurrection. The glorified body, the incorruptible body, the imperishable body, the invincible body that the book of Corinthians promises is a truth that we hold on to. And one of the major, major reasons why we have to worship our God, even Job himself, uh, in, in, in a time when he was living during the time, most probably of the patriarchs, Abraham, he already had an understanding of the resurrection. And allow me to share to you from Job 19 and verse 25 and following. It says, and as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. And even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God. Let me repeat that. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God. Now notice here, as early as the time of the patriarchs, as early as the book of Job, you already find here an understanding that there will be a resurrection. And that resurrection should be the major reason why should why we should worship the Lord. Let's rise from our seats and let's, let's worship Him.
Be proud.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Great news everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. The title of today's sermon is The Truth on the Resurrection. We will take our text from Matthew 22, verses 23 to 33. Let us read this passage. On that day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother, as next of kin, shall marry his wife and raise up children, for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So also the second and the third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken not understanding the scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Let us now bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that today we can celebrate your resurrection. For Lord, as you have been raised from the dead, we too shall rise from the dead. And with this truth, Lord, let this bring encouragement to each and every one of us. I pray for the Holy Spirit to be with me that I might be able to expound this particular passage with justice. Lord, we thank you and bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, as we very well know, it is only Christianity that claims that 
their leader, founder, and Messiah rose from the dead. There is no other religion that can make that claim, only the Lord Jesus Christ. And that has not been contradicted because the Lord Jesus Christ remained here on earth for 40 days after He had been resurrected, and hundreds upon hundreds of people witnessed His resurrection. And therefore, that truth cannot be contradicted. Now, today, we will be talking about the resurrection. I think it is but apt for us to be able to talk about this because there are still a lot of people who happen to doubt whether there is indeed a resurrection. And for us who have put our full weight of trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is such a comforting doctrine because somehow we know that there is an afterlife and whatever we do for Him does not go to waste. You and I know that we shall be rewarded in the next life. Now, the resurrection is probably a doctrine that only atheists do not believe in. Now, however, you do not expect religionists denying a belief in resurrection because practically even all religions have a concept of the afterlife, no matter how twisted, no matter how flawed. And I'd just like to share to you some examples. The ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, for example, is filled with ideas and stories about life after death in the tomb of the great Pharaoh Cheops, or Chops, I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. And this person died some 5,000 years ago. Archaeologists discovered a solar boat intended for him to use in sailing through the heavens during the next life. Now, ancient Greeks as well often placed a coin in the mouth of a corpse to pay his fare across the mystic river of death into the land of immortal life. And then some American Indians buried a pony and bow and arrows with a dead warrior in order that he could ride and hunt in the happy hunting grounds. Norsemen buried a dead hero's horse with him so he could ride proudly in the next life. Eskimos of Greenland who died in childhood were customarily buried with a dog to help guide them through the cold wasteland of death. Benjamin Franklin, who did not claim to be a Christian in the biblical sense, nevertheless had the following epitaph inscribed on his tombstone. I'd like you to have a listen. It goes, the body of Benjamin Franklin, printer like the cover of an old book, its contents worn out and stripped of its leathering and gilding, lies here, food for worms. Yet the work itself shall not be lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more beautiful edition, corrected and amended by its author. So there you go. I mean, you can go from religion to religion. There is somehow a concept of an afterlife. And of course, you and I know that a lot of these religions do not really declare the accurate truth about the afterlife. And yet again, most people really have that understanding except for atheists, as I mentioned to you. Surprisingly, however, when we go to this passage that we will be studying, it was something that was found centuries back among the Jews, who were not ordinary Jews, but who were chief priests and priests themselves. And it was this that caused their lives to become earthly instead of heavenly. So I'm talking about the Pharisees. No, I'm talking about the Sadducees, rather. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not believe in that. And for me, it is quite a surprise. Why? Because, again, they were people of their official religion, Judaism. And yet, sadly, they did not believe in the resurrection. And as I mentioned to you, this somehow affected the way they lived. And that is why they were so earthly-minded. They were so worldly. 
they were so uh, into materialism. They followed the dictum, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Now, there are three lessons we will learn today. First, in verses 23 to 28, a wrong premise comes from a wrong conclusion. In verses 29 to 30, a right premise comes from a right conclusion. And then finally, in verses 31 to 33, a right premise comes from the Scriptures. So let's talk about the first part in verses 23 to 28. And here we will be talking about a wrong premise comes from a wrong conclusion. But first up, let's read verse 23. It goes, On that day some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned Him. Now allow me to give you a little background once again, because again, we will not be able to appreciate the questions and the answers of the Lord Jesus Christ and the counter questions that take place unless we have a historical background regarding what happened during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we need to definitely know who the Sadducees were. And so allow me to share a few things as a cultural and historical background. Well, the Sadducees uh, happened to be a sect composed mainly of people from the priestly line of Israel. So we would assume they would come from the Levitical line and that uh, they were the uh, successors of uh, Aaron in that sense. But sadly, they did not believe in the resurrection. And by the way, this sect was the wealthiest and the most influential. And obviously, we, we cannot doubt that because people obviously looked up to them because of their high priestly and lofty position. Now their theology had turned them into greedy and power hungry people because obviously that is what would happen. I mean, if you have no concept of uh, the next life, then definitely you would start thinking about how you can enjoy this earthly life because you're thinking the best life ever is here on earth and not in the next life. So when you have that concept in your mind, in your heart, definitely it will affect the way you live. As uh, the book of Ecclesiastes would say, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Now, going back to the Sadducees, they were the aristocrats of Israel and they were largely in control of the temple and the operation of the priesthood. And it was primarily through the temple concessions of money changing and sacrifice selling that they obtained their wealth. It's not surprising that they now attack Jesus because of the cleansing at the temple. If you still recall how the Lord Jesus turned the tables and drove out the money changers, obviously they did not want to lose business. The high priest and the chief priests were almost invariably Sadducees. Now, it is quite amazing that these Jews, because of their, again, religion and because of their high uh, position, it is quite surprising that they did not believe in the resurrection when, in fact, they had the scriptures and it is innate somehow in man to believe in the afterlife. I mean, a lot of people, they may not consider themselves as saints or as even good people. But even such people, at the back of their minds and, and deep down inside, they somehow sense the truth that there must be an afterlife. I recall James Dwight Dana, a 19th century professor at Yale University. He said that he could not believe that God would create man and desert him at the grave. And then one of America's most popular authors, John Irving, made the following statement in an article in U.S. News and World Report. And he goes, in my view, there is no safe place in life in my stories reflect that. The only safety and peace of mind that is discoverable on earth comes from a firm belief in an afterlife. 
So it's no surprise that so many people hold to such beliefs. And he went on to comment, I do know that the only people who seem to me to feel safe are people with belief. And incidentally, that is the reason why I'd like to be able to expound on the resurrection, not only because we are celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the basic foundation of our faith that we have been forgiven by God. But at the same time, I want to be able to talk about the resurrection because I believe that this is something that will truly generate genuine hope. Because if you know that there is a resurrection, as Jesus said, if I, if I rise from the dead, you too shall rise from the dead. I mean, if we have that hope, then we can go on in life feeling very secure. I mean, we can get sick with a terminal illness. And of course, that could be a depressing and discouraging thing. But at the end of the day, when you know that there is an afterlife, you maintain that hope. You maintain that hope that though your body uh, may become sick and though you may die, you will still have a bright future in the very presence of the Lord. Now, the danger of not believing or placing importance in the resurrection is that we will become so earthly minded. And basically, again, this is what happened with the Sadducees. That is why they were accumulating a lot of wealth. And by the way, they thought that the wealth that they had would somehow testify to the fact that God loves them, that God has favored them. And that is why in their minds, it was difficult to think that they would still need a Savior. I mean, if God has blessed us so much, then He must love us, then He must really uh, be pleased with our lives. Otherwise, why are, why are we uh, in this state? You know, they were asking those questions. I mean, why were they blessed if not favored by God? And sometimes, friends, we are like the Sadducees in the sense that we do not think about the next life. And, and this is true not only of unbelievers, but even of believers. Sometimes we're not thinking of heaven. We're so earthly minded. We're, we're thinking about our earthly dreams, our aspirations, and, and all of that. And what becomes of that is that we become earthly minded. If we're not focusing our mind and our hearts on the things above, then definitely we'll focus on the things below. And we have to be very careful because as believers, even we ourselves might have that tendency. You see, if we ignore the resurrection, we will be attracted to the world and the world will destroy us. Allow me to share a little anecdote. During the 13th century, many strange devices, uh, devices were created to torture and kill people. And perhaps the most deceptive of all was a life-size statue of a very beautiful woman in an attractive setting. Her arms were outstretched as if to offer a loving embrace. And when the cruel men in charge of this evil invention wished to see an enemy die a horrible death, they would tell him he was among a selected few who were privileged to view this beautiful figure of a woman. And often the superstitious victim would be so fascinated by the statue that he would draw closer and closer to inspect its beauty. But as he stood directly in front of it, then the arms would suddenly move forward and clutch him while a hundred knives simultaneously emerged to pierce his body. Well, don't you think this is a rather graphic analogy of the world that we are so attracted to? and how we do not know that it might lead to our downfall, our misery, and our own tragedy. As the Bible says, there is a way which seems right unto man, but it is the way of death. Now the Sadducees, like the Pharisees, wanted to bring Jesus down. And here we find them asking a difficult question to show how foolish 
a situation would be if there were indeed a resurrection. So that's what they wanted to prove, that the concept of resurrection is really a foolish idea. And they were saying such a foolish situation cannot come from God. And so God could not possibly create the resurrection. And so this was something that they had in their minds. And so let's go to the question they had. In verse 24, it says, Asking, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now, this was taken, by the way, from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 5 to 6. And let me just tell you the reason why this law was instituted by God. The object of such a marriage law was to perpetuate the line of the dead brother and to keep his property within the family. So that was the intention, to perpetuate the brother's name and so that the property might remain with his own family. Now, there were seven brothers in verse 25. Uh, there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So also the second, the third, down to the seventh, last of all, the woman died. Now, what they did here was to give a theoretical situation in application of the Mosaic law. Now, after they made this statement or this theoretical statement, in verse 28, they come up with this question. It says, In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. Now, the question was, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Their point was, how could God create resurrection since it would create chaos and confusion in the next life? Can you imagine one woman with seven husbands? How will that work out in the resurrection? So, in other words, they were thinking in terms of the chaos and the, the difficulty of having multiple husbands with, with just one woman. In fact, they were probably insinuating that if she is married to all seven, that would be an incestuous relationship of which God cannot be party of. So can you imagine the, the trick question that they had here? And obviously that trick question came out of the fact that, well, they did not believe that people rise from the dead, that there is an afterlife. And so in verses 29 to 30, Jesus gives them an, a principle, and the principle is this, a right premise comes from a right conclusion. So let's read verse 29, first of all. It says, But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus declares that their concept of resurrection was faulty, and so with their understanding of Scriptures, and also the capability of God to resurrect a dead body back into life. And so two things. They did not trust in the power of God, and secondly, they had a flawed understanding of Scripture. And when it comes to the power of God, allow me to just share a little illustration. An example of God's handiwork is expressed in Job 28, verse 26. And this verse tells us that He rules over the rain and decrees a path for the thunderbolt. Now, Lightning has an impressive and terrifying power. Scientists have found that a single bolt can carry 100,000 volts of power. And worldwide, lightning strikes the earth 360,000 times every hour. Not just every day, but every hour. Think about all that cumulative power and we're just talking about the thunderbolt. So why would it be difficult for God to be able to resurrect somebody? And God already proved to the world that He is so powerful. How? By resurrecting our dear Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the reason why we are celebrating Resurrection Sunday. 
because we know that our God is risen, that the tomb where he was laid is now empty. There is no evidence of his dead bones. There is no evidence of any remnant of his earthly life. He has ascended on high and is now seated uh, at the right hand of the Father. And so friends, again, it, God proved that, that he could resurrect uh, someone and the, the primary example would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, going back to our text, in verse 30, it says, For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now, in the resurrection, there would be no such confusion and chaos. Why? Since the order of things would be different in heaven. So again, our problem basically is we think that that earth will be a complete replica of heaven. That is definitely not going to happen. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ is pointing here. Heaven will not be a replica of things here on earth. And we have to understand that marriage relationships in heaven would no longer be binding. And this is the reason why Jesus Christ said that we will be like angels in heaven. The Bible says, again, that we would be angels in, in the sense that we do not intermarry because angels do not marry. Such will be our heavenly existence. And for those of you who are married, I hear some people saying, those who have had a good marriage, ay, sayang. But I also hear others saying, ay, salamat. Maybe because you did not enjoy your marriage. But anyway, kidding aside, now marriage was needed here on earth to fulfill man's basic need and responsibility. First, man was in need of a special companionship that only the opposite sex could provide. And God did that because God wanted the race to procreate and multiply. As we find in the book of Genesis, it says, go and multiply. And this, by the way, is the second reason for the necessity of marriage. Now, such a condition is no longer needed in heaven because we will no longer need that special companionship with the opposite sex. Uh, God will be the one who will replace that uh, companionship relationship with our special fellowship with Jesus Christ, who happens to be the bridegroom, and we happen to be the bride of Christ. Secondly, there is no more need for procreation. So we see here that marriage is really just a temporary program of God. It is merely an earthly program of God. So we go to our third and final point. A right premise comes from scriptures. It goes in verse 31 to 32. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. But Jesus knew that this question was really raised just to show the stupidity of the resurrection. That was the motive of these Sadducees. And Jesus goes straight to the point and addresses the main issue and proves to them that the scriptures teach the resurrection. The statement indicates when, when it says, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The statement indicates that God is the God of Abraham who now exists. And so with Jacob and Isaac. In other words, they did not die. He was still their God because he is, or rather these men were in heaven. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. The context of this passage of scripture was that God was speaking to Moses in the burning bush incident. And if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead, then God would not have said, I am, but I was. I was the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac. But he said, I am. And again, that already implies that these three patriarchs were still alive. So Jesus turns to the scriptures to prove his point. 
The point of Jesus is that if anything cannot be proven by the Scriptures, then it is not true. But again, the Scriptures teach about the resurrection, even in the Old Testament. While you and I may not find it in greater abundance compared to the New Testament, it is right there. In fact, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was prophesied in Isaiah 53. And so, again, there is no reason to doubt that there will be a resurrection. Now, it is this resurrection, by the way, that makes us Christians die gloriously, uh, showing and displaying great hope. I'd like to share to you a few things. Um, for example, thinking of the fullness and duration of this wonderful life, uh, w. Uh, B. Winson, a great preacher of past generations, spoke from his own experience just before he died. He said, I remember a year ago when a doctor told me, you have an illness from which you won't recover. I walked out to where I live, five miles from Portland, Oregon, and I looked across at that mountain that I love. And I looked at the river in which I rejoice, and I looked at the stately trees that are always God's own poetry to my soul. Then in the evening, I looked up into the great sky where God was lighting His lamps. And I said, I may not see you many more times, but mountain, I shall be alive when you are gone. And river, I shall be alive when you cease running toward the sea. And stars, I shall be alive when you have fallen from your sockets in the great downpulling of the material universe. So notice how this generated the hope to this preacher of God. And that is why the doctrine of the resurrection is such a powerful doctrine, a doctrine that we cannot marginalize and minimize. Why? Because this is where we are able to have genuine hope. And when you have this view of the resurrection, you will now invest in the next life. And that will cause you to be more heavenly minded rather than earthly minded. And that is what the Lord Jesus wants after all. That is what Paul wants after all. Paul himself declares in the scriptures that we need to fix our eyes on things above and not on things below. And friends, that will only be true if we believe in the resurrection. The writer Everett L. Fulham pointed out that when an eagle senses it is about to die, it leaves its nest, flies to a rock, fastens its talons on it, or talons on it, looks straight into the setting sun, and dies. He said how his father, who was a Christian, saw beyond the sun just before he died. Unexpectedly, Awakening from a coma, the dying man spoke appreciatively to each family member at his bedside. Then noticing the tears coursing down their cheeks, he told them that if they could hear what he had been hearing and see what he had just seen, they would not want him to recover. Finally, gathering up his last ounce of strength, he exclaimed, Rejoice with me, this is my crowning glory. And with that, he died. Indeed, when you have the hope of the resurrection, you will die gloriously and you will die with genuine hope. In verse 33, when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The multitudes were amazed with the wisdom of Jesus Christ. There was no question that was a mystery to Jesus Christ. How can there be a mystery to Jesus when He Himself is God? And that is why, notice what happened here. The Lord Jesus won another battle against His adversaries. And again, he, is, he was able to prove the doctrine of the resurrection. The teaching here is clear. If you want to get things right, well, you need to go to the Scriptures. And when you go to the Scriptures, you will rightly conclude that there will be a resurrection. Dear friends, just like to greet you once again, a happy Resurrection Sunday. 
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you, Lord, for this time. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and love towards us. And thank you that we could celebrate the resurrection. Let this be our motivation to live our lives for your glory, um, fixing our eyes on things above rather than things below. Heavenly Father, bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, dear brothers and sisters. Happy Resurrection Sunday. And again, please continue to like and subscribe to our videos uh, on Facebook as well as on YouTube. And please don't forget, we also are on Nationwide Radio through FEBC. And we're also on Nationwide TV through GCTV and Light TV. God bless you all. We'll see you again next Sunday. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. Our radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM, broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 AM to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Sambuanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from Station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Greetings everyone, we already have three weekend services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 
zero zero. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is one zero two one zero two three four eight one. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is one four five two zero zero five two eight six. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount. Enter the name LWCCCII and account number 001-00006065. And send the receipt to office at livingword.ph. Then click send money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click give. And then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.